Mark VI Power Armor. I do not want to die. But I want something else even more. I want them to suffer. I want him to die. And so, this is why I stand here in the open, standing beneath a banner of parley, as arranged. Standing amidst the carnage, fires and rubble, blackened marble covering cold white faces, all dead, all gone, buried beneath their own splendor. This world was never my home, but I helped take it once, helped free its people, helped direct the reconstruction efforts, left it a place of vibrant trade and bustle. It was never my home, but it is a soul-crushing tragedy to see it wounded thus. Nobody, nothing moved in the streets, not in the open, not since they attacked. Nobody cleared the bodies, nobody dared. Yet here I stand, lit up like a star right in the open, waiting. I have yearned for this day, to finally get to grips with this cur. He has slain so many of my brothers, butchered his way across this world. Yet now, in the last, as he strides out, I am not so confident anymore. I do not experience what you would call fear, but I can know trepidation. He's even larger in person than through the vid screens, towering, one might say. But I am hardly a pipsqueak myself. There are no short astartes, as they say. Yet, as his strides eat the distance between us, I finally see the depth of my error. Or oh, that is what he thinks that I should feel. I lean into the effect. I hoodwink him. I'll need every last advantage I can get. So I carry my power sword sheathed but obvious. I donned my old helm with the markings of the assault companies. He can see the field generator. We are not so unalike. We are both Astartes. So I lie through my very war plate. My back is to the river. I must turn and fight. Sun Tzu. This is the known wisdom. He is a son of Perturabo. He knows no differently. Or so much I hope. Tenacious foes, but intellectually lazy and tactically uninspiring. It is rumoured that this is due to the frequency that the Lord of Iron changes his command staff. Fickle, undisciplined. The Iron Warriors are inflexible. Yet this one is able. I was concerned that he might have sent a proxy. But no, he is unmistakable. He came. Yet he is a behemoth, for he strides towards me covered head to toe in tactical dreadnought armor and the newest pattern to boot. It does not have the same silhouette as the top heavy cataphracti warplate. This is Indomitus armor, but it is still exactly what I had hoped. It is slow. And inside it, hulking as he does, he will feel invulnerable. I can see from the floating picked capture cams in his wake that he does indeed believe this. He intends to humble me in front of his entire army. And today, they will get a spectacle all right. One way or another. Of that, I am certain. He stops at twenty paces between us. Again, as agreed. Yet there is a slither of respect there. He still wears his helm. Not as egotistical as I had hoped. But this will make the affair drag out all the more. Good. It is what I need. 
time. They hit our system so hard, taking out the long-range sensors from behind and gliding into the interior on low power. They powered up and bombarded each world with any notable population centers. Their assault coming so fast, they met hardly any resistance from the army and militias anyway. But we few scant units, we astartes, we held firm. We bit and buzzed at them, culling where possible, leading them into traps again and again. The burning cities of this planet became one huge urban sprawl of clashes and swift withdrawals, and we were taking a mighty tithe from the foe. But then he came to take command. Pilter Ankas of the Iron Warriors, a lapdog of the cudgel, Tarax Antarax, who commanded the fleet and system assault entire. He had turned the tables on us swiftly, and we could not escape him. His churning over saturation of sectors were impossible to evade when encircled, where others might flinch at such punishment. Centurion Arncast held firm and closed the net with reinforcements. He hunted us. He slew us and I could not hold him off any longer. So I tried to buy time, because we knew exactly why they had hit this unassuming system on the edge of the main thrusts of their heresy. They were going to take control of our comms arrays and then, with codes torn from our hands or consumed with our brains, they would send out distress signals, luring shattered legion elements from far and wide. But Antarax had a formidable fleet, ample support. Any flotillas or raiding formations that arrived would be annihilated before they recovered from transit back into real space. So, I had to buy time. I knew the end was inevitable. We lose. I lose. But do we let it be for nothing? That I would not countenance. So, we fought all the harder. Hard enough for Centurion Ankas to accept a herald. I sent my own Centurion Tullius out the first time to listen to their terms. He returned and reported that there were none. Unconditional surrender. Or the Iron Warriors would hunt down every baseline human alive and skin them like they were the eighth. The eighth. They'd do this anyway. I was quite sure. So I sent Tullius back, and he issued my challenge. Trial by champion. If I lost, we would surrender our defensive positions immediately. If they lost, if he lost, they would retreat for a span of seven days. We both knew they would not leave us alive, but then, I knew they would never hold to this, even so. But it gave me another two days, as I accepted, of course. And so, we are here, he and I, two gene-forged weapons of war, the finest the Emperor could create. He looks at me, laughing behind his visor. He sweeps his arms out wide. The whirring and clunking from the motion alone would draw attention. He lurches forward a few inches in a sort of semi-bow. And as he rises, he brings up his right arm and his combi bolter spits out at me. But I am not there. As he mocked, I moved. I rolled to the side and then sprang further, diving into dense cover behind a fallen pillar the width of a rhino. But he could not hear me. Certainly not over the report of his own bolter. Certainly not with the clangor of his own armor echoing in his ears. I zig and zag as I move faster than I have ever in my life. My new warplate is like wearing silk compared to his lumbering bulk. I put distance between us and take up a firing position to his side. He still looks forward as I take aim. My first shot bounces off his shoulder, Pauldron, as intended. He turns to face me but he is slow. 
My enhanced sensor bundles from the new armor, the Mark VI. It notes his every move, his every weakness. And I gain a perfect, if near impossible, shot on his inner knee. As he moves, I spray a fire of three shots. Two bounce off, one smashes a segment of his Terminator armor. He will limp now, dragging that thing behind him. He can move, but it will only be by his own strength that performs this. The servo coupling is broken. His fiber muscle bundles will not help him now. Rolling again to avoid the return fire, he hits only marble and vapor trails. I hurl a frag grenade to shroud my next moves. He practically ignores it, as he should, but it gives me a few seconds. And when the smoke clears and the dust falls down again, another three shots come from me at the Terminator. This time I fire into the left arm's wrist and elbow actuators. I miss the wrist, but I hit the elbow. He drags his left arm now, the power fist a colossal weight. He will only manage a swing once or twice before his muscles snap under the strain. Fed up of the chase, he fires again, but does so while charging. He lurches toward me in a desperate sally, combi bolter rounds rebounding off my own left pauldron thanks to the bonding studs. Mine is the lighter armor, but it is no less solid than Mark V or IV. I lead him on, allowing him sight of me to keep him interested. He must finish this swiftly. He knows that. He must. And the next move is either insanity or stupidity on his part. He smashes directly through columns now instead of going round. His endurance flags already. But I do not string it out, much as I wish to. For he might run. So I evade him until he barrels through the last and thickest marble column, only to find I am not there behind it. I am to his side again, and I have followed him with my sights. Now my bolter resounds again and again. I take out the connections to his suit. I smash the other knee. I hit the right arm again and again, chipping away at it until finally I get a penetration, and his arm slumps down at his side as he topples forward. He strikes the ground and attempts to rise, but he is so slow without the Terminator fibers augmenting his strength, and he could do nothing when I advance on him. I do not get close, but I do take my time. I make sure all can see this, as I take out a crack grenade and roll it across the ground to stop under his very face. Perfectly timed, of course. It explodes and ends him. For the vaunted power of the tactical dreadnought armor, the Terminator. It is this, the new Mark VI, that made all of this possible. When it is done, when this slime is dead, they attack anyway. Returning to my own lines, the expected happens. Fire comes from the traitor armoury infantry, and the battle resumes with a blood-curdling war cry torn from all of their throats as they charge. They think nobody will ever know what happened here, that it meant nothing. But they are wrong. The enemy, the Iron Warriors, they witnessed this. They will carry it in their hearts now. And they will know fear. My revenge blooms within the chest of each of them. When it's quiet in the dark, they will see me in my Mark VI armor. And when they see hundreds of my brethren in the same armor, they will falter. I sow the seeds of the victory of tomorrow. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, faces, and forces of the Warhammer 40k setting. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. A reminder that we have other avenues of entertainment, links in the description. 
give us a like and a share if you enjoy the video to support our ongoing efforts against boredom. And also, you can join our Patreon if you wish. Now, let us proceed. For today is a very special day. For today, I can finally talk about the most important thing in Warhammer to me. The Mark VI Corvus Power Armor. The original. The best. But what is it? How and why was it developed? And why was it so important? Well, gentle listener, lend me your ears, and I shall endeavor to explain. I shall attempt to refrain from gushing too much until the very end of the video, where I give my personal thoughts. But now, for the very basics, <laughs> I shall explain. Mark VI Corvus Pattern Power Armor Created barely before the Horus Heresy, the times were utterly different. The Imperium of the tail end of the Crusade, almost indistinguishable to the monolithic horror it became. For the leading lights of humanity still walked amongst their kind, their people, and they collectively still dreamed the same dream, even if it was only a brief period. A tiny snapshot of what could have been, what we lost. For in those days the Emperor, Malkador the Sigilite, and the Primarchs led from the front, and not just in battle, although of course this was their main concentration, but in all ways. The Primarchs pushed forward military technology as fast as the Mechanicum at that point, and some of these advances could then be used to enrich ore, as is so often the case. And good enough was never quite what they were aiming at. Not the Primarchs. Not their attendants or attached staff. They were seeking not only excellence, but perfection. For one legion, the Emperor's children themselves, it led to their ruin. But the point must be made about the perspective of the time. For the present era of suffocating regression, the broken heart of the human race smashed and yet again bunkering from a cruel and capricious universe, is not what was meant to be. And when Horus saw this future, the time period of the grim darkness, it slightly unhinged him, created the crack that allowed the corruption of chaos to seep into his mind, body, and soul. Yet in those days, the future seemed so bright. As many will so often demur, the Imperium itself was no paragon of a society. Far from it. There was slavery, pain, hardship, and massive chasms between ruler and ruled. With hereditary nobility so far removed from the plight of their people, even then, the Imperium was no golden vision of the future. Humanity had already had that period, and we lost it. Yet, when the legions were all one, when the Golden Throne had not become the Emperor's tomb, there was a chance at least and they were all working towards that halcyon future. The power armor of the Astartes, the Space Marines, was constantly in development. The Mark IV was meant to be the most advanced and powerful, adaptable and useful warplate, yet they did not stop there. The Mark V was in development even as the Mark IV was shipped out to the Legions, yet this became known as the Mark VI when it was finally put into production because the Mark V designation was already attributed to the hodgepodge warplate that was under construction across many an exploratory fleet or forge world, taking parts of the previous models, as we have discussed already. Yet the Mark V, now to be dubbed the Mark VI, was diligently researched and subsequently constructed. For the nature of the wars fought by the Crusade and its legionary backbone had altered. Long ago, when the crusade began, it thrust out from terror in near every direction. Its guide was the emperor and his treaties, the Principia Bellicosa. And the legions, the marines, were used as they had been in the unification wars, as sledgehammers. They took on the enemy directly, giving no quarter. Yet as time passed, and the sons of the emperor, the Primarchs, were found and then returned to their legions, the true potential of the Marines was released. The Primarchs led their gene sons in ways that baffled even experienced veterans. 
They could outthink anyone alive, absorb information on changing Noah spheres or battlefields at the flick of an eye. They knew how to unleash the power of their sons, and their effect on tactics and strategy were beyond transformational. Let it always be said that the Emperor was a genius, but let it never be said that his greatest skill set ran in the direction of wars. He trained his Primarchs, then let them get on with it. But why the extensive description of all of this? Because few consider how the Marines had altered over the time. At the start of the Crusade, mass Marine charges were par for the course. By the end of it, few of these events occurred, and those that did were often highly controversial. The legions had developed, had evolved. Now they were performing surgical decapitation strikes, taking the heads of the leadership of any resisting force, then simply exterminating the body of the army in all the confusion. The legions had very distinct specialities where they would shine, but all were more than capable of any approach to warfare, and a crossroads had come. For the higher levels of recording, support and analysis provided reams of data by which the legions could be analysed. And the data was clear. The Marines now fought in brief, swift battles of unfettered annihilation, or were forced into horrific battles of close-quarters shooting, grappling and stabbing, boarding actions, bunker bashing, the worst forms of combat imaginable. They were not for line reinforcement, not for massed conflict, unless the nature of the Xenos was astonishingly powerful. The Solar Auxilia, an Imperial army, supported by elements of Knight Households or Titanicus Legios, could deal with these events. Hence, it was decided that new armour needed to be made with these roles in mind. And the tactical Dreadnought armour, what is more commonly dubbed Terminator armour, was heralded as one possible way forward. The Imperium was so wealthy in resources, production facilities and expertise that they were plotting to cover every single Marine in the Terminator armor that is now so rare. Imagine that. Entire chapters and legions of Terminator armored Space Marines. And this was not blue sky wishing. This was an attainable goal then. That is how wealthy the Imperium was. Yet the other strain of investigation led to a completely opposite conclusion. The Angels of Death should be fast. The Crusade had revealed so many lost partial STC templates, so much technology, that the Mark VI was superior to its predecessors in a myriad of ways. It was more efficient in its power consumption, far more modular, so damaged parts could be replaced easily, and was far quieter and made stealth somewhat possible. It had increased sensory capabilities in the elongated nose segment, making it superior in many ways. It was lighter than any previous armor, but with no substantial drop in protection. It was a modern set of armor for a new method of war. The enshrining of the knowledge that Marines were not Thunder Warriors. They were not slabs of augmented meat with warplate and artillery as firearms. They were the most skilled, swift and deadly warriors the human race had ever known. The custodians aside, of course, but custodians take far too many resources to create to ever conceive of using them in most wars. The Mark VI was not universally hailed nor lauded. Perturabo and others had little respect for it especially in light of the tantalizing promise of endless ranks of tactical dreadnought armored marines. So, they attempted to bury the armor by sidelining it in an inconvenient war with little to be gained, and they gave it to Corvus Corax and his Raven Guard. Yet in the Scaland campaign, the Raven Guard grew to adore the new mark of warplate. They enthusiastically sent back a million observations and a plethora of ways it could be changed and improved. When the Mark VI was rolled out to the other legions, it was done so wholesale. Needless to say, 
It is most associated with nippy and sneaky forces, like the Alpha Legion and its namesake, the Raven Guard, and their Primarch, Corvus Corax. But it went out to nearly all of the Loyalist Legions, for by this time Horus had shown his hand, thrown off the sheep's clothing, and revealed himself as the wolf that he was. Yet, even in the traitor forces, the pattern was known amongst the Forge Worlds that went over to the War Master, as they simply hacked their loyalist counterparts for the blueprints, and they produced them in bulk also. When the Siege of Terror was finally realized, many on both sides had this better armor. They had to. For the Siege was the end game, and both sides knew it, so both fielded the very best armor and support they could. Yet many will still scratch their heads that the Terminator armor was not rolled out. But, as the heresy went on and more and more Forge Worlds and Manufactorans were destroyed, the maintenance of that which still existed was placed over the production of incredibly resource-heavy armor for their foot troops. Simply put, the heresy burnt through the realm of humanity, consuming so much that the Forge Worlds were simply not able to create them in sufficient numbers to make any of these grand dreams a reality anymore. As both sides hurled more and more men and materials at each other, the ability to rearm was swiftly slipping away from both sides in the fray. Hence, Terminator armor became ever more rare as the Mark VI blossomed. So it was that the Mark VI and even VII power armors were seen during the Siege of Terror and then the War of the Scouring. The speed, the updated heads-up displays, the sound reduction that permits no warning allows the true strength of the Marine to flower, to bloom. It is not the heaviest armor, but it did not need to be. As the crews say stretched from one edge of the galaxy to the next, the largest and most brutal races had already been brought to heal or exterminated outright. The Rangda were gone, the Nephilim, etc., all had fallen. The line slugging matches that started the crusade were over. Now the skill of the marines would be allowed to truly shine. Originally, there were hordes of often scum sent in miniature tank armor, told to march towards the enemy or be dropped into their very midst. But as the wars dragged on, now the skill of the marines would be allowed to truly shine. The marines were always shock troopers, but now, when the Terminator armor was no longer possible, but when the Marines saw how they could take down these walking artilleries, these unstoppable forces, then they grew, on a spiritual level almost. Because they now saw that they were so, so much more than just armor and weapons, strength and resilience. They were the greatest human warriors the galaxy had ever seen. Even better than the Thunder Warriors. For those were a blunt instrument. The legions were eventually to be seen as a scalpel, just one that cut so wide that the recipient of their ire would never recover. And it was almost righteous in its timing, because after the heresy and the scouring, the time as a primary army had gone, but their power, if anything, had increased. By embracing their skill, not just their power, by acknowledging and harboring their experience instead of their war gear, they took a step that permitted them to change, to evolve. The Chaos Warriors of the Long War looked down on modern Marines, calling them thin bloods and weaklings. But if that were true, if power were all that won out, why did so many of these weaker shadows of their former glory stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against their older and purer copies? If the modern Marine was so pathetic, how did the Imperium hold out for so long against the Orc, the Tyranid, the Elder, and the Tau? It is easy for the older to look down on their successors in age or experience and say, they do not make them like they used to do. The elderly have been chiding and deriding the ego youth since time began. To everything a season, as they say, so too is it with humans. Yet, what may not be done as well by old patterns the youth excel in those areas that are more important in the regime or circumstances that they face. The trials of each generation are different. So too must be those ways of meeting said trials. 
and that which has always worked may no longer be optimal, but is clung to out of habit or superstition. Rubute himself decried that his codex was not altered, updated, or improved upon, and treated with some ridiculous veneration. For he saw that his book was a treatise on the current ways to wage war. He never expected it to be sacrosanct. For warfare changes, as does every environment in time, and the differences in the Astartes of the legions and the chapters cannot be understated. In a pitched battle, then the legion would win hands down on a field. But in a modern campaign, juggling calls for aid and many threats, the chapter Astartes are almost unfathomably more skilled, precise, pragmatic and proud. And in any engagement, the legion would take casualties as a matter of fact, the cost of the drums of war. But the chapter Astartes know that the greatest assets they have is their marines. Much less would be lost to gain the same result. The legion would fight to the end, no matter what. The chapter Astartes did and do not have this luxury. For the legion marine knew that an entire imperium of advanced production was behind it. Casualties and materials of war could be replaced swiftly. The chapter marines know that anything lost may never be replaced. Or if it is, the delays and cost will be high. By simple dint of the times they fight in, have their approaches and strategies and tactics evolved. Boiled down to its quintessence, if a legion of the crusade fell or acquired support, they knew that their brethren legions could fill the gap, could come in hard and save the day, or grant revenge. There were twenty legions at one point, but eighteen for most of the crusade, each around or over one hundred thousand marines. But now, they say the Imperium has a million star systems in its orbit. They say that there are a million Astartes under arms, one for each lonely star in the void of space. Thus, if a chapter of space marines allows themselves to be caught in a war of attrition, is they refuse to think and allow honor or being trapped to waste their force, then they leave 999 stars unprotected. Imagine that. They only fight when there is no other choice. They only fight when there is no recourse. They only fight when the fate of humanity is threatened. And still, they fight near every day. The legions were on the very cusp of finally doing it. They were on the footstep of bringing the entire galaxy under imperial compliance. If Lorgar had not turned, it might have been only another century. And this is the difference. The Crusade Marines were always winning. No matter the odds, no matter the horror, no matter the foes they fought, they were winning. And they could practically taste it, the ultimate victory. So much so that what next became a topic amongst the Primarchs. What do we do after the war is won? Oh, there was trepidation, but only for what came next. All expected the message to come down one day, or labored toward that one goal. All knew that there would be parades and triumphs aplenty, entire days or months of martial celebration. It was so close. But not so the Marines of the Chapters. The Chapter Marine knows his duty is to come home alive, for the next battlefield awaits, the next world requires their assistance. There will never be a glorious end with pomp and parades. There will never be a day of ultimate celebration. They fight against the dying of the light, no matter how dim and dingy, misbegotten and cruel the light may be. The Legion Marines fought a war of conquest. They fought on battlefields of their choosing, where pride and passion were all, and victory was both food and water. The Chapter Marines fight a never-ending war of constant contraction and defeat. Far-fighting frays ever on their enemy's terms, dropping into hellish conflicts that more often than not are traps merely to wipe them from a sector so the enemy can have a free hand. The Legion Marines were butchers and builders. The Chapter Marines are guardians or avengers. They are not the same. Yet in my mind alone, it is this 
the Mark VI armor that tells the entire tale. When a crossroads had been reached, the truth came out. The Marines are not just tank-grade armor and fire points of destruction. They have changed with the times. And now, they are knights, desperately standing on the walls of the Imperium, holding back the darkness. And now, to the Gushathon. For this, the lovingly dubbed Beaky, or Wombles, as we called them in the day, is the most important armor of all, as it was the very first set of power armor to ever exist in reality. In those heady days of the late eighties, they arrived, a box with exactly thirty of them, a ready-made army in one place. It was the beginning of what we call Warhammer 40,000. Now, of course, it is only a part of the greater hobby of wargaming, but it is a special place to many. A place of horror, the worst possible outcome, but also a place where infinite tales of bravery can be told. No matter how much we should all fear and loathe the characters who perform these deeds, the governments that they represent, the death of hope and enlightenment, regression instead of progression. The decaying suffocation of a human empire dying under its own weight and inertia, so much taken from the epic works of Asimov, the Knights of the Realm, the Space Marines, being a play on the Jedi, on a more temporal manner. A very British look at the questing knight, instead of the Lucas parody Samurai. The magical or religious culture towards science, also straight from Asimov, the barbaric xenophobia of the Terminators of Nemesis the Warlock, the cybernetic holocaust of Battlestar Galactica, to be later joined by the spiritual successor to Khan Noonien Sung, being the Primarchs, the later Doctor who sprinkles in the Perpetuals, and of course, the Highlander, sorry, Emperor of Mankind, a mix of Torquemada and Connor MacLeod, with a little Professor X or even Magneto thrown in, you see, people think that Warhammer is the grim darkness of the far future. Well, it may be. But perhaps it is just a myriad ingredients that were so plentifully abundant in the period it was created. And this is why some of the oldest hands, like myself, who were stood in queues outside shops early on wet winter days, well, we see it more like a huge flashback to our youth. Each component of the whole, so mismatched to the modern audience, we see things like items on a Christmas tree, like animals on a child's mobile. Warhammer 40k was simply the zeitgeist of the period, thrown into a blender and then slapped onto a page. And that, that there, the slipshod fun of it all, then tongue-in-cheek alongside the dark humour, it also is of its time. Some of those sources were more than a bit camp, and that is why it can be difficult for some of us to take it all too seriously. Warhammer 40k is not a place for deep thought and depressing cogitation about the horrible nature of man and the universe. It's a hellhole covered in sparklers. You dive into it like you would a horror novel, but when it is over, you put the novel down. And so it is with the hobby. It is a laugh. It was irreverent, and it was fun. Most especially that. Fun. Bogro walls and VCR roads. Technicolor troops and everything based fluffy goblin green. If you'd asked for a competitive game, not a fair one, but a competitive one, people would have looked at you like you just asked for a chocolate whirlwind. Mildly bemused at the least. And that is no slight on the current scene. It was simply not a thing. Not in the places I grew up, not in the literature I read. And I would like people to be proud of their armies. It's why I always take the position of the faction I am covering in my videos, as it means that they have at least one rah-rah video just for them. We spend so much time with our armies of wee men, buying, making, painting, collecting and playing, displaying, and even just trooping them on a rainy day. It's good to have a hobby that relaxes the mind allows you to swip away to a harmless idyll. Well, 
The inverse of this, of course, but at least when you wonder what your troops are up to, you are not worried about real-life woes. So it is this great escape that is called the hobby. Some claim it is weaponized, monetized, like a cult of control. Alas, I think that people need to step back a bit sometimes. That we can call ourselves members of a community, we are fellow fans of the hobby, because at any date, at any time, in any place, you can simply say, Yep, that was fun. But what's next? Then sell the lot and start a new phase of life, with new interests and new passions. So do step back when it gets too fraught. Nobody on the planet has to play, read, enjoy, or participate in this hobby. And anyone can leave at any time. It's a choice of pastime. It's never ever life and death. We do this so we can chill. Have fun with friends. Then get up each day and strive to make the world a better place. To continue to struggle for friends and family. To smile when we don't want to. To be kind when someone has been nauseatingly obnoxious. It isn't life. So stop taking it so seriously if you can. Enjoy it for what it is and for the love of the throne. Stop fearing missing out. FOMO, as it's called. If the figure does well, it'll be out again. Bet your bottom on that one. They spent all this money to develop and then create the mold, right? And if it dies, then having one model through eBay will be easier, or you simply won't want it if the sub-game doesn't get off the ground. Replace FOMO with what I call FOAB. Fear of waiting a bit. I find it puts it into perspective, eh? But always remember, it's just a hobby. It's meant to enrich your life. The second it does not do that, for your own sake. Don't join every chat and inform everyone it's poo. Just head out and enjoy something else. Life really is too short and you only get the one crack at it. So try to be happy, eh? Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.